so now guys now we are almost done with the part of doing classes so now we have gone through all the three algorithms now what i'm going to do is two things i'm going to first summarize it for you once again so that you understand what exactly how this works and then what we are going to do is ask a few more detailed questions about what happens if your features are continuous variables or something like that right so we have not talked about all of that so we'll talk about that in a while so let's first let's first understand the algorithm so let me summarize this so you have a starting node which is the root node and all of these algorithms are basically somehow where they are measuring the impurity score right in case of only in case of chi square you would measure basically measure a purity score but in case of other algorithms you are basically make checking for some impurity score let's call that impurity zero right so this is the impurity score of the no root node right at root node now they say there are five possible features right so you would basically check for each of those five possible features what is the impurity node of combining both of them combining all the possible not both it could be multiple child nodes right say if there are three child nodes so com con so now summarizing all across all the three possible child nodes you are basically compare what is the impurity score for that particular so this is say let's consider this as a feature f1 on feature f1 there were three possible splits and across comparing the impurity scores for all of those three nodes you come up with the impurity score one right so you say weighted average of all the three impurity scores you come up with a impurity score based on the feature split of f1 now again you take the root node and now you consider split based on feature f2 and say based on f2 you can only come up with two possible child nodes now again you compare the impurity score for both of them you take a weighted average and that comes out to be impurity score of two so this is this is root node it has an impurity score of imp zero and so on and so forth right so you understand the game the game is basically you have a root node and you calculate impurity scores for all of the child nodes take the weighted average and that's the impurity score of the split now of all the possible features f1 f2 we'll basically consider the feature let's say now we consider find that feature f3 is the one or say f1 is the one which gives us the best possible split so now feature f1 at three possible splits and f1 is the one which minimizes our entropy or minimizes the impurity so impurity score could be entropy Gini index whatever it is it basically is the one that minimizes my impurity score the maximum so basically this this three nodes are very pure node as compared to the this two nodes right so now that we know that this three nodes are impure nodes so, uh, sorry this three nodes are more pure than the other options so we go ahead with this one so this is f1 equals to say some value this is f1 equals to some other so f1 equals to zero f1 equals to one and this is f1 equals to two so the f1 basically is a discrete variable and there are three possible options 0 1 2 and for each of them you have this three nodes right now for each of these nodes you have the impurity score now you're again gonna consider all the features starting from f1 f2 and f3 for each for this node you're gonna again calculate for what are the possible features to split on which is f1 f2 and whatever features you have and you're again gonna choose based on all the possible split which is a feature to based on which to split this one and the same thing you're gonna do for this one and again the same thing for this one right so this is intuitive right now you understand decision tree is way more better that how the algorithm exactly works during training time please keep in this mind this is all for the fitting during training time in the test time you already have the data points you know which is the which is the path the particular loan applicant would follow and based on that you decide whether to give him a loan or not right but in training time this is how you're gonna decide right so feature based on each of the feature possible values you have split it first here because feature f1 gave you the least entropy least impurity score and after that you again try and split them right and you can split them again you can keep on splitting them the option being obviously as you understand this is a computationally extremely expensive algorithm right because you are, every time you have a node you have to think about which is the we are, you compare all the possible features then figure out out of them which is the feature to split on right and you understand this exponentially increases right so at the first step you are only checking for all the features once because it's a root node at the next level you have you have to check for three times right because there are three possible child nodes and for each of them you have to compute the all possible the you have to compare the impurity scores 
for all the possible feature splits right again you have to do it for here do it here right so the, the number of computation increases exponentially as the depth of your tree increases right and you and the point is we don't ideally ideally we should not be stopping until and unless we reach a point where your impurity score is completely zero or the purity score is completely one right so which is basically to say we have reached a completely homogeneous node people where basically people consist of only people who have watched a movie or people who have not watched a movie right so we have absolutely separated them out into two different parts but as long as we don't do that we are not supposed to stop but then if we keep on if we that is a stopping criteria that we have then we that's a very computationally expensive algorithm so what we do here is we basically uh, start and we basically say that we kind of want to do it till a depth of say three or depth of four right so something that is this is a call you have to take depending on the computational resources you have or a lot of other concerns we are going to talk about them in a while but the idea is it's not necessary that you always do the calculation till the end right because it's it's computationally expensive and it's obviously prone to overfitting that something we will see in a while uh, but you understand this that it's it's not feasible to always go down till the point you reach an impurity score of one so what we do is we sometimes say that we want to cut the tree only till the level three so we are just going to have a tree till level three so if that is the case let's try and understand the concept of predictions once again so now you start off with a node and let's say you just for now let's for simplicity let's just take a tree of depth two okay so let's see you had an impurity score starting here at 0.99 at this point the impurity scores were a bit low 0.91 here and say 0.81 here so this impurity scores are gonna be lower than 0.81 so the impurity score is say 0.5 and impurity score is say 0.4 and this is lower than 0.91 so it could be 0.85 here and it could be 0.3 say here right so these are say these are random numbers i have cooked up on the go so the idea is that you have seen that as you kind of go down the decision tree the entropy or the impurity score kind of tends to get down because uh, by inherent design of the algorithm we are basically going to go ahead with the split that reduces this entropy so at each step the child nodes both of them are supposed to have lower entropy than the parent node so now that is the design so we understand this now let's understand what happens in case a new person comes into the bank and applies for a loan say now he, he comes into this particular node right so this is the node where he ends up because of whatever data features he have say this is age age criteria and this is some other criteria based on which this split has happened and he ends up in this bucket so now how do you take a call whether to give him a loan or not so how would you do that so the idea is this that say in this node in the training because we have not split completely so this node would probably contain say 100 people out of them 48 people have been given a loan and 52 people would have not been given a loan so if this person ends up in this particular bucket then you say that okay i think we can give him a loan with a probability of 0.52 because out of 100 people 52 people sorry not 52 you can give him a loan with a probability of 0.48 so which is less than 0.5 so you probably would not want to give him a loan right but if there's a probability that you want to associate with your classification decision this is how you get your probability right 0.48 right but let's say you end up for some other applicant you end up in this particular bucket and in this particular bucket out of 100 people let's say 60 people have been given a loan 40 people have not been given a loan so in this case if someone ends up in this particular bucket you are going to say that okay probably we have to give him a loan with a probability of 0.6 right so in this case 0.6 is greater than 0.5 so you can give him a loan in this case 0.48 is less than 0.5 so you don't give him a loan right that is pretty clear so this is how you do test time prediction so the thing that i wanted to kind of bring out was that there's a probability also associated with giving a loan it's always not a okay give a loan or not give a loan there's a probability with which you say okay i think i can this is a probability with which i can give a loan and that probabilities are derived using this right so in case you don't have a completely a tree which doesn't go down to completely 100 or a 0 100 0 kind of a split because this is a 60 40 split this is a 48 52 split right so you can stop your trees at this point also and if for any per new person who comes in and he falls into this terminal node or leaf node you say that 60 the 60 percent is a probability that he would get a loan 
and if you have to form that you have to derive but whether to actually give him a loan then you say okay 60 percent is greater than 50 percent hence we give him a loan but for all calculations that we know of right AUC calculations or um, uh, probably for any other calculation that requires probability values this is how you come up with the probability values right so all as you probably know all classification problems you have a zero one output right this is your target and y prediction is a basically a probability that you come up 0 0.5 0 0.8 and then you set a threshold and you say we had seen this for logistic regression you set a threshold and you say if the probability is greater than this threshold you are gonna give the label one to that particular value particular data points or if it's the value is less than that threshold you are gonna go ahead with uh, assigning a label of zero to that particular so in this case 0.5 is say it's or 0.54 right let's say 0.54 is greater than 0.5 so you assign a level of 1 and 0.8 is also greater than 0.5 so assign a level 1 again here now here the threshold threshold is 0.5 right this is something we have come up with and this is not something that I have explained in the logistic regression lecture also this is not something that is hard bound you could have a threshold which is 0 0.7 say so with a 0 0.5 threshold this is the output level now with the threshold when you shift it to instead of 0.5 you have a 0 0.7 so this threshold now if you have a threshold of 0 0.7 so the output class would be 0 here and output class would be 1 here right because 0.54 is less than 0.7 so this threshold we have already talked about slightly how you decide using AUC and other measures so I'm not going to talk about that today but the idea is that what I wanted to kind of bring home the point is that all of the prediction value all of the predictions that you have for bank loan applications comes with a probability value and this is how you calculate the probability based on the leaf node which he ends up in there would be some amount of population of from both the classes depending on that you come up with the probability of him being either given a loan or not given a loan so now the second question to answer here is what happens in case there's a there are a lot of continuous because in this case we have seen there are feature one and feature two and which can only have two possible values so that's why you had a very easy way to split them into two possible buckets right so if either feature one equals to yes or feature one equals to no in case of employment student are working in case of age 28 plus or not so it was a very easy way of doing the entire algorithm right because we did not have continuous variables what happens in case there are continuous variables so now let's consider a discrete example so why is your dis why is the target variable that is still some uh, let's say these are still discrete variables right we are still doing classification tasks so these are not continuous so let's say this is how your y looks like and say this is the x value right so x1 one of the features right one of the features but that is continuous now not any more discrete variable because it is a discrete variable the splits are easy right x1 equals to 1 is one split x1 equals to 2 is another split and x2 equals to 3 is the other split so you have three possible child nodes right but in case of continuous variable you have to come up with the threshold x1 greater than 40 x1 less than 40 all of those right so those are how do you come up with that magic number 40 right we saw that here right so the question here is let me kind of go back to that slide if possible or probably not so in case we when we saw the example we saw age greater than 40 right so that was the first criteria we saw in case of bank application my so now you understand if for discrete variables how did it come up with the whole point of age right how did it how does it choose how does it choose a feature for discrete variable discrete features is something you already understand now for continuous features we also have to understand how does it come up with this threshold number right 40 how did it come up with the number 40 so for that let's take our example y target variable and these are your these are the feature values right the feature values could be 15 let's say 20 20 3 25 26 28 29 so how the algorithm works for continuous features is this that for it basically is gonna check for all of those points threshold points where a decision changes so here if you order them in a increasing order you see that this is the point first point where a zero changes to one again another point where one changes to zero zero changes to one and then here one changes to zero so these are basically one point one point number two point number three 
and this is point number four. So these are possible four threshold points where my algorithm needs to check. So for all of these four threshold points, it's gonna check for x1 greater than say some value here, right? Between 15 and 20. So say 18. Between 20 and 23 is say 22. 23 and 25 is say 24. And 26 and 28 is 27. So for each of these four particular threshold points, it is gonna check the same values, the Gini index and everything. The algorithm at the end of the day is still the same. It's just how you compute the computation. When it's a continuous continuous input, how do you calculate this magic number of 40? That's what I'm getting at. So for at all the possible threshold values, so basically it is gonna check for age greater than 18, then age 22, age 24, age 27. And it's gonna see which is the one that minimizes the impurity, the max, which basically lowers the impurity by the maximum amount. The same idea of Gini index, right? Because you can still, for each of the possible splits, you can see what is the impurity of the child nodes produced, right? And the same way you had done it for discrete variables, you're gonna do the same calculation once again. I'm not gonna go into that for this particular example, but you understand this, that it's the same algorithm that we are gonna do the once again, right? Only how you come up with this threshold points is what I've shown you here. So in this case, the, for any continuous feature, it basically checks for all the points where the decision has changed from one to zero. And for all of those points, it's basically checked as threshold. So or for all those points, it's going to compute the Gini index or whichever impurity measure you are using, entropy, whatever it is, it's going to use that and compute what is the correct threshold point to go ahead with. So now we have done all of this. You clearly understand how a decision tree works when you're classifying, when it's a classification problem. You start off with a node, you check the impurity score and based on all possible features, in case discrete features, it's easy to think which is which are the possible pos splits. In case of continuous feature, this is how I have already explained how you calculate the possible splits. For all possible features and all possible splits, you basically calculate the entropy of the child nodes, entropy, Gini index, whatever, so impurity score of the child nodes and whichever feature split gives you the least impurity score or basically the most pure child nodes are the one that you go ahead with. Now I have talked enough of this. So now I'm gonna talk about something which is slightly different from what you know. So now I'm gonna talk about decision tree for regression problems. So that probably might sound a bit, you know, uh, doesn't sound right, right? How does decision tree even work for uh, regression problems? But the idea is fairly similar and we'll, we'll, while we talk about it, you will get a good hang of it. But the idea is very simple to what and very similar to what we have already learned. So the thing now here is instead of the target variable being whether someone has watched the movie or someone has not watched the movie, it could be something like age. Age where everyone has different ages and that's a continuous variable. And then for predicting age, you would use a decision tree. So how would that intuitively work, right? Let's take a moment to think about that. So now instead of discrete variable ones and zeros, you have a continuous variable that you're trying to predict. So again, you have continuous variables which are very mixed in the starting of the root node. And now you want to separate them, but continuous separating continuous variable is not very intuitive. What is basically intuitive is this, that you have a lot of continuous variables in a very different range, right? And what you want to do at the end of the day is basically bring them in a separate group such that such that this both the, the child nodes that are produced are basically a lot more homogeneous within themselves. That is, what is a measure of homogeneous homogeneity in a continuous variable? It is bias, it is what is you call variance, right? Variance is basically how much your dispersion of your continuous variable is, right? So the concept is inherently the same thing. You have a lot of variables, lot of values in the root node, which have a lot of variance within themselves, right? So variance is pretty high because there are a lot of different kinds of values. And now you want to split them such that this variance goes down in the child nodes, right? So like the way we did for impurity, so there's no concept of impurity as such, but the concept is now changing to variance. So you're gonna measure the variance, it's gonna be high at the root node. As you go down the nodes and so on and so forth, the variance is gonna go down, right? So that is exactly how you're gonna do it. The rest of the algorithm remains exactly the same. So only the concept now changes from impurity to variance because there's nothing like it. Now the, the, the target variable doesn't come in discrete classes. It comes in a range of values and you want to basically split them such that those range of values are very limited and constrained. So I think you already know the formula for calculating variance. So I'm not gonna go into that. So now, 
already know this right x bar is a mean and the x actually is a number of values so i'm not going to talk about variance as such so the algorithm is as i've already explained to you is basically about redu reducing the variance so you're going to go for so now you again you start off at an impure node you're going to consider all the possible feature splits and you're going to go ahead with the feature split that gives you the least variant child nodes so this is what i've already told you so now let's do the calculation for the Dunkirk example again, right? So because it's a Dunkirk example where people were watching a movie, it was yes or a no decision. We cannot directly use it as it is for a regression problem. The only way we can do it is basically treating our ones and zeros as continuous variable and assuming that they come from a continuous description. So basically we'll assume that uh, someone can watch a movie. Also, there's a, there's a 0 0.5 or a 0 0.4 value that is possible. Uh, not the most optimal idea, but since we are already familiar with the Dunkirk example, let's go ahead with that. It's easy to understand when you have the data set already that you understand. But obviously, try and appreciate that this is fundamentally a classification problem because your target variables comes in only two values. But for sake of understanding and easier, uh, you know, easier comprehension, we are just going to stick with treating it as a continuous value and seeing how this algorithm works. Right, so let's first calculate the variance of the like the way we did for all of the other algorithms. Al, like for all of the algorithms, let's first calculate the mean of the root node. Right, so mean and the sorry, let's first calculate the variance of the root node. So the mean of the root node is 0 0.52, which is now there are 26 zeros and there are 24 sorry 26 ones and 24 zeros, and you take a mean that comes out to be 0 0.52. Now you calculate variance. So variance is calculated as deviation from mean. Sum that, square that up for all the instances. So you calculate that in the same way. So variance of root. Uh, so variance of root comes out to be 0.2489, right? So 0.2496, which is roughly 0.25. So now let's consider again, like as we had done earlier, let's consider all the possible feature splits and let's see which is the one which gives me the lowest variance. So now we do it for gender. We see again calculate the mean for the gender no female node and we calculate the variance. Variance for female node is 0 0.23. And then we calculate the variance for the main node. Male node, the variance comes out to be 0 0.24. Again, something you have already seen. Female node is more purer than the impure male node because the female node consists of 63, 37 kind of a split as compared to male node which consists of a 44 56 kind of a split so the variance number also if you calculate is obviously lower value in case of female node as compared to the male node so now you calculate the total weighted uh, weighted variance for the gender based split that is exactly the how way you calculated it for the entropy and the gini index values so it's 28 by 50 into the variance of men and 22 by 15 to the variance of women so that comes out to be 0.23 now let's keep that in mind and go ahead now let's look at employment based split we already know from previous example that gender based split was something that we always preferred it always gave us more pure nodes now let's see if that is the same conclusion we can reach after we do the employment based split on based on reduction in variance if re does reduction in variance also agrees with agree with our chi to chi square Gini index and entropy based methods. So for that, let's first calculate the employment based uh, weighted variance. If we do split based on employment, this is what we get. So we get the variance of each of the nodes. Student node, the variance is pretty high 0.246 and 0.248 for the working node. So now let's see what is the weighted variance for the split based on employment. So that comes out to be 0.248. Now, if you remember the weighted variance for a split based on gender was 0.238 and that was obviously now you can see is lower than 0.248 which is the split which is the weighted variance based on employment so obviously you all as i have explained variance is something you want to reduce down as you go down the decision tree you want to start off with a node which is widely varied and you kind of want to go down into nodes which are which has lower variance so that's what exactly you have done here and you want so you see that the variance of weighted the variance when you compute against employment is higher as compared to when you do it when you split based on gender so you're going to go ahead and split based on gender because you want to reduce your variance 
so variance again is uh, is a basically the measure which you use for in case you are trying to do regression based task so decision tree is mostly used for classification task but there's also a use case where you can use decision tree for regression based task and this is exactly how regression based task uh, decision tree for regression based task work right so now there's one particular thing that i wanted to talk about decision tree based regressors and uh, we'll talk about that here so which is basically how does a prediction happen so this is how you have done training right your training was you had a variance score here which is var 0 and then again you consider all possible feature of f1 you considered all possible fe possible feature f2 so this gave you var 1 this weighted score of the variance of both the child nodes here gave you var 2 and so on and so forth and now of all the possible feature splits f1 f2 and so on you basically went ahead with the one which gave you the least variance so let's say var 1 was the one you went ahead with and so now you have this node now again you're going to split them using variance so whichever feature out of all the possible feature gives you the least variance you're going to use that to split this and you're going to do the same calculation here consider all possible features see which is the one which gives you the least variance while splitting this particular node and you're going to use that to split this particular node right so this is pretty interesting so now the only thing remaining to understand here is how do you do a test time prediction so now let's say a new applicant comes into the so it's a say age prediction right so some this is a continuous variable that you're trying to predict so you have all possible same let's say consider all age uh, education i'm not sure if age education is something that determines your height but let's say we are trying to do height prediction okay let's say we're considering the problem of height is a continuous variable so we can use decision tree regressors to predict that so now height is something that is that is what we want to predict based on age education and some other features so now given this is the decision tree looks like so let's say the first split base was based on age and based on age you ended up here now the next split is based on education and based on that you end up here right so the first split you end up here the second split you end up here so this is the bucket that you end up finally in so how do you finally predict in case of classification you remember we basically saw that what was the distribution of the ones and the zeros and based on that we gave a probability as what is the probability with which the person should be given a loan in this case this person has ended up in this bucket and based so let's say there are 100 people out here and we want to predict the person's height so what is the easy way to predict a height is basically take the mean of all this 100 people whatever the mean of this 100 people are that is probably the height of the new person who falls into this bucket right so this is the terminal node that this person has come into has fallen into and based on all the 100 people who are there in this particular node you basically predict that this is the corresponding height that this person sh should be this is the predicted height of the person whom for whom you are predicting so this is this is person p1 whose age and education we have written down and this person p1 ends up here so p1's predicted height is basically nothing but the mean of the hundred heights that are present in this particular node right so that is our test time prediction for decision tree works you can instead of mean you can use median and whatnot so this is something that you take a call on this is something you have to decide what is the thing that you want to do but apart from that this is how broadly the overall algorithm for decision tree regressor looks like you have different features based on which you classify you basically choose the one which gives you the least variance and you keep on doing this until a point you either find it computationally expensive or you basically reach a point where it just got one particular person in the child node or the variance is already down to zero that is where everyone has the same values so until unless you don't reach those are the three terminal node condition you don't keep on stop splitting and that is how you do training time fitting for test time prediction this is how it works you for every variable you basically see which nodes this person falls into and based on that you basically take their mean value mean of that particular node in which he falls and use that as a prediction so now that we know that let's see how you how how you can obviously as i have told you and you can clearly see here also that uh, uh, pandas and scikit already implements all of this for you right there's no need to kind of uh, worry about how you implement reduction in variance or how you implement 
Gini index based measurements. Those are something that you can already do in scikit. You all you have to do is basically pass a parameter. So this is the example. So in this case, we first load a data frame, which is the loan prediction example. And we see that there are five columns in there. Five columns are the independent features and your Y, which is the prediction value, which is whether loan should be given or not. So that is a one zero variable. And you again split it into train and test size with 70% of the data in your train and test being 30%. So now, uh, now let's check the accuracy of our algorithm on training set. So yeah, so now we had a look at all of the algorithms, the decision tree, regressor, the decision tree, classifier. The classifier comes in three variants, the chi-square based, Gini index based, and entropy based. The regressor, as of now, what we have seen works based on reduction in variance. So all of that is fine. Now let's look at the practical bit of it. How you and how do you build a decision tree in real life using scikit? So the first part of it, which is fairly understandable, so there's nothing much we can talk about it. So you have imported a decision tree classifier. So we are just gonna talk about the classifier part of it. Obviously for experimentation purpose, you can do this at your end using regressor on a data set suitable for regression. So we are gonna talk about the loan predictions data set. So where the basically uh, the data frame consists of, let's see how the data, before me talking about it, let's just plot it and see how this looks like. So, So this is a data frame where we have loan status, which is whether the person was given a loan or not. That is a one zero variable. So this is suitable for a classification problem. Your output variable or the target variable comes in zero and one class. And there are five independent features, right? So application, applicant income, co-applicant income, loan amount, loan amount term, credit history. So applicant income, co-applicant, loan amount, loan amount term, all of this seems to be continuous variable. Credit history seems to be a one zero binary variable. And that's how our data set looks like, right? So ideally we have talked about how, uh, we have talked about all of the things, right? So how your continue, when if your input data consists of continuous features, how it looks for all of the threshold points where the decision is changing and for all of those threshold points, it basically calculates the Gini index. So we know we don't, there's nothing which is completely unknown to us about how this algorithm works under the hood. Now let's try and understand this algorithm, how it is implemented in scikit. Uh, by the way, this particular disclaimer slide, which asks whether do you know accuracy, what accuracy is. Do we know accuracy? We have talked about it in the logistic regression class, but let's try and understand accuracy a bit further. Like, let's recap it for you once, for once. Accuracy is basically the number of times you have picked up from the test data set of the examples given to how many of them have you picked up correctly, right? So we have a target variable and we have a predicted variable and your target and predicted how many times have they matched. So in terms of confusion matrix, that was number of true positives plus number of true negatives by all examples, which is true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. So that was what accuracy is. So now let's go ahead and see how, how you implement this on a real life using scikit. So first you call the decision tree classifier, you fit it on train and then you predict on test and using that prediction, you basically calculate the accuracy. So we have first used Gini index as the criteria and we see that we get an accuracy of roughly 65%, right? So now uh, let's see Gini index using criteria of entropy. So the same data set we are now gonna use, all that we have done now is instead of criteria is Gini, we have now said criteria is entropy and we are gonna do the same bit. So train, fit on train and then do the predict on test and then do the accuracy. So we see a slight improvement in accuracy, which is because of the entropy, but that let me kind of reiterate. This does not, this is not a blanket statement, which means that entropy performs always better than Gini index. This is probably just for this particular data set that you have seen that. For any given data set, you have to first be able to appreciate why to prefer entropy or when to prefer Gini. Log on to Grey Atom's learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.